Greetings. Well, here we are. Ultima 9 Ascension. The best Ultima game in the series and a satisfying conclusion to a long-running classic. I'm kidding, of course. Everyone knows this game's reputation by now. While Ultimate was the real start of Ultima's downfall, well, technically the mid to late game of Serpent Isle was, but Ascension pretty much put the series in the ground. And there are many reasons for that. One is that the game was in development for five years and underwent many design changes, which culminated with an unfinished product that had extremely poor continuity with previous Ultima games, and at times, doesn't even make sense even within its own entry. I'll explain all that in a bit, but I'll start off by saying that even though 7 and 8 were my first Ultima games, I was hugely excited for Ultima 9. I bought the game at release and was really looking forward to once again exploring the wonderful world of Britannia. And then I popped the game in, installed it, and that excitement turned into a slow decline into disappointment the further along I got into the game. And to explain my disappointment, well, I played this game back when it came out. And after I finished it, I never came back to replay it. That probably explains what I think about it, but when it comes down to it, the problem with this game is not the gameplay, it's the story. Like I said, the game released in an unfinished state and is riddled with extremely poor continuity and a ridiculous amount of plot holes. The reason for that is that originally, the game was supposed to look like this. An Ultima game in an isometric 3D engine. However, the Ultima 9 team involved with all this you see now were moved to help with the development of Ultima Online, which I will explain a bit in this video. Originally, very originally, the game was supposed to take place on the Guardian's homeworld, with the plot being the Avatar facing off against the Guardian with his titanic powers. However, Richard Gary decided to scrap this and set the game back on Britannia due to player feedback. Probably the right choice since it would have been more platform and action oriented than Ultimate 8, and players were really looking forward to being back on Britannia after being away from it for two games. At least according to Hacky's page here, not much is really known about the original storyline, and my memory is very fuzzy, but I could have sworn I read this in game magazines back in the day. When they scrapped this engine for the pure 3D version, there were major revisions to the overall storyline, which resulted in a game that just didn't make any sense, with the gameplay being marred by many technical issues such as annoying bugs and crashing. Some of those bugs are still prevalent even in unofficial patches, but to be honest with you, I don't remember the game crashing on me that much back in the day. I was pretty confident it didn't, because I clearly remember more when crashing quite a bit at release. Then again, I must have memory hold that because Ultima 9 through God crashed on me quite a bit during this playthrough. Other than that, the game runs fine pretty much out of the box through GOG. I opted to install the unofficial patch and the unofficial patch only. There's a dialogue patch out there that fixes holes in the story, but I decided against that since I wanted to re-experience the game's storyline at release. I suppose I'll start off talking about the gameplay. And as far as the game goes, well, like I said, the problem isn't the gameplay, it's the story. The gameplay is honestly fine. I don't remember having a problem with it back in the day. I actually had fun wandering around, fighting monsters, collecting loot, and all that general stuff. I will say I never liked how you earn stats just by progressing through the main storyline. Every time you cleanse a shrine in this game, you can choose which stat you want to raise, instead of just earning experience points by fighting monsters or finishing quests. Monsters in this game only drop gold and equipment. And I suppose that's another point I want to raise. The game tries to be immersive, and at times it is, but why on Britannia do creatures such as rats and wolves carry gold? Makes no sense. Not to mention the fact that gold is no longer an item like in previous Ultima games. It just shows up as a number on your backpack. Same goes with arrows, and they max out at 9,999 and 999 respectively. Actually, a welcome change for most gamers. At least you don't have to juggle piles of coins like in the Black Gate or the numerous different currencies in Serpent Isle. But for me personally, I like having gold as its own item, but that's just me. That brings me to the inventory while I'm at it. No longer can you place items wherever you wish, like in 7 and 8. Now, backpacks and bags have their own item slots, with the backpack itself having 20 slots and bags having 9. Plus, you get a belt that can fit 12 items. Likely the best system they could come up with, considering this is a full 3D game, but I gotta say, the inventory system in 7 was one of my favorite things about it. But like 7 and 8, your backpack and bags are going to be jam-packed full of stuff. I ran out of room quite frequently as I was too afraid to drop plot important items after seeing my flaming sword disappear in the avatar's bedroom. Magic is back, but instead of consuming reagents for spellcasting, you only need reagents to bind scrolls to your spellbook. It's disappointing too to see that there are only 4 spells per circle of magic, but despite that, I was really only using the heal spells, as well as some situational spells. A lot of them just aren't necessary to completing the game, so I didn't bother trying to bind every scroll I see. 
It's honestly a chore too because I think one of the reagent shopkeepers in Minnock was bugged because she was endlessly walking outside instead of tending to her shop after I finished the main story there. Controlling the avatar feels fine, but creating him is actually a downgrade, even to Ultimate 8, if you can believe that. You're stuck playing the blonde guy again, this time, you can't even choose his name. However, you can choose your class through the Gypsy like in earlier Ultima games. Likely, Ultima fans watching this would already know, but how it works is that you choose answers corresponding with the virtue questions the Gypsy asks. The idea is that you would choose answers you yourself would choose, based on the moral dilemma you're presented. So if you tend to be compassionate, your class would be a bard. I always chose honor, so I end up as a paladin. But if you wanted to play this game and want to get all the best armor pieces, just know that for some reason you need to start this game as a ranger. The starting queue you get in Stonegate opens up a chest in Scar Bray with a Blackrock helmet, and from what I've seen online, there is no other way to get it other than cheating. Don't know why they designed it like that, but there you go. Aside from that, the avatar is easy to control and move around and such. The only problem is that he runs really slow. It's like he's got weight strapped to his ankles. Combine this with the extremely slow ship travel, and it really adds to the overall game time. According to HowLongToBeat.com, if you're wanting to do a full completionist playthrough in this game for some reason, you're looking at over 100 hours of playtime. For me, it took a little over 40 hours to finish this game. There's no way I'm playing this game for over 100 hours, so I end up skipping a few side quests. The benefit to finishing them though is that it raises your karma and mana. Other than that, they're not very interesting. One side quest I completely left alone because finishing it closes off a really good shop in Buccaneer's Den. If you're wanting to bind scrolls to your spellbook, they're basically the only merchant in the game that can sell you Mandrake Root. The shopkeeper I mentioned in Minnock also sells them, but she got bugged for me as I said earlier. I'll expand on the ship travel section for a bit, but after a while, you meet an NPC with her own ship that enables travel throughout Britannia. And since I mentioned that ship travel is freakishly slow, well, Good news is that most of the time, you can just talk to her and tell her where you want to go. It's not until about the halfway point where you're allowed to commandeer the ship for yourself, and thankfully, I only had to do that about a handful of times. Considering how long this game is, I probably would have quit if you were forced to go from point A to point B like this for the rest of the game. And the fact that the sea shanty theme doesn't play adds to the overall disappointment, though I doubt that would help. Let's see. Nope. Not at all. And I explain more of how buggy this game is. When I was first able to man the sails on my own, my next task was to go to Trinzig. I messed with the sails a bit and immediately stopped and asked Raven to take me there. However, the game would crash to desktop each and every time I chose Trinzig, which forced me to sail there every time. Thankfully, it didn't happen for any other location, but there you go. When it comes down to actually controlling the avatar, fighting monsters, exploring, talk to NPCs, and the very general stuff, I gotta say the gameplay really isn't all that bad. That may sound like an unpopular opinion, but other than how slow the avatar runs and how slow the ship moves, I just didn't feel the frustration. And now, that brings me to the graphics, which was pretty mind-blowing at the time. A fully 3D, explorable world with voice acting, monsters to fight, loot to collect, quests to do, a great soundtrack and whatnot. Playing this at release on a CRT monitor was a heck of an experience back in the day, at least at first. Even today, I don't find the graphics all that bad, and that's coming from someone who always tries to mod graphics in video games such as Morrowind or Skyrim. There's more to a game than how it looks though, which brings me to the story. Okay, look, we've all seen Spoonie's video, so I'm not going to break down each and every inconsistency that we all know about, such as... What journey? What evil has been unleashed in Britannia? Who are the gargoyles? Do you know anything about the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom? What's a paladin? <laughs> What's a paladin? There we go. But the reason why I and many other Ultima fans back in the day were absolutely disappointed with this game is the storyline. The reason for that is, just in case there's new Ultima viewers here, the story is very poorly connected to previous Ultima games, which results in a lot of things that just didn't make any sense at all. Not only does it have poor continuity, it's also inconsistent even within its own entry. The game itself isn't sure whether it's been 20 years or 200 years since the Avatar last visited, as an example. I'll start back at the end of Pagan. The Avatar conquered and absorbed the Titan's powers, becoming the Titan of Aether, and used their energies to construct a blockade of his own, 
and used it to return home to Britannia, only to find out that the Guardian has already conquered it. However, for some reason, you start back at his home in Austin, Texas, sleeping away with no care in the world, which doesn't make any sense. Like I said, the entire story makes no sense. The story to this game is awful. It's terrible. To this day, I have never seen a story as bad as this in any video game. To give you an idea of how excited I was for this game, I ignored this entire tutorial bit in the beginning. I figured it was here for a reason and told myself, oh okay, well this is just a tutorial section, it's more for explaining mechanics or something. I basically trusted that the writers knew what they were doing. I mean, this is Ultima. The stories to the previous two games that I played at the time are wonderful. Unfortunately that just isn't the case, so silly me, right? It only gets worse from here on out too. Beyond that, the tutorial does a good job of telling the player how to play the game at least. Well, from my memory it did because I skipped it and explained it myself as I was streaming. Moving on though, the gist of the story is that the Guardian is attempting to conquer Britannia through the use of giant evil columns that are twisting the virtues into their polar opposites. So the people of Britain are no longer compassionate towards their fellow man, the paladins and the people of Trinsic are dishonorable in their dealings, the mages of Moongla are no longer honest, turning deceitful and untrustworthy, and so on and so forth. You get the point. Sounds interesting, except Ultima V kind of already did that, and in a better way too even. What with Valor being you shall always fight to the death or you'll be labeled a coward, or you shall always tell the truth or we will cut out your tongue. I haven't talked about Ultima V, but back when I finally played it, the whole theme of that game was very interesting. But with Ultima 9, the whole presentation of this game is just off, even if your starting point in the series is 7 and 8 like mine was. To explain this entire mess as quick as I can, the Avatar has to visit each town, conquer the respective dungeon, grab the corrupted glyph, find the virtue sigil, place them on the respective virtue shrine, and restore it through the use of a specific mantra. Doing so will restore the virtue in that area, making the people act how they should, as well as giving the Avatar a choice of upgrading one of his stats. It also makes the town music sound happier. But this entire bit doesn't really make any sense. Going back to even Ultima 7, it was the people's choice to follow the virtues or not. And in that game, most of them pretty much moved on in favor of the Fellowship. Which, by the way, isn't mentioned at all in this game other than the Museum of Plot Holes in Britain. The Avatar himself was something for the Britannian people to emulate, to be a better person. It was a choice. I get that the Collins would force the people to be on the polar end of compassion or honesty or whatever, but when everyone gets restored, they start acting like their respective virtues, as if it was the magic behind it instead of their own free will. But this is basically the entire game right here. Visit a town, go to the dungeon, grab the glyph, find the virtue sigil, find the mantra, rinse and repeat. One thing that was really disappointing was the linear nature of this game. I don't mind linear games of course, but when you get your map and you arrive in Britannia, it really seems like this is going to be a 3D Ultima 7. But it's not, unfortunately. You don't get a ship until a little later and the option to travel through moon gates, which should also be impossible, is done by freeing a mage named Nico in Cove. I'll explain it while I'm at it, but in Ultima 7, a moon gate is just something you step in, and you're transported to whatever town it decides to take you. They were also destroyed once the Avatar blew up one of the generators. In earlier Ultima games, they show up depending on the positions of the two moons of Britannia. In this game, you put the orb of the moons in the circle of stones, recite the mantra for its respective town and shrine, and step in. And there you are. Which is not how it works. Then again, the moon gate is not supposed to be purple either. But anyways, I should probably go ahead and explain this. There are three moon gates in the Ultima series, blue, red, and black. There are also time gates in Ultima 2 and Savage Empire, and moon gates of several different colors in both Underworld games. I'm just going to explain the first three. Blue moon gates enables travel within a world, red lets you travel between worlds, and black, which enables interdimensional travel, and can be created through the use of black rock. But the biggest thing here is that the orb of the moons you get is mostly used to travel between worlds, same way the Avatar and Lord British did. You can still use it on Britannia and travel to other towns and such, but the thing is, you can use it anywhere. There's no need to place it in a circle of stones. As I said though, Moongate travel should be impossible because they were shut down in Ultima 7, and there's no explanation as to why they're back all of a sudden. When it comes to progressing in the game, you are given a choice as to which town to go to on occasion, and the game does open up a little bit as the game progresses. But this is definitely not an open world game. Imagine if Ultima 7 came out and you had to finish Dungeon Despise in Britain before moving on to You or Minoc or something. And you had to repeat all this before opening up the game world. 
Once you leave Trinzic in the beginning of Ultima 7, even though the game makes it clear that you should travel north to Britain, you could ignore that and just go south and hit up a moon gate. Let's say you wanted to recruit Dupre and you knew he was in Jellum. Well, go grab him and put him in your party. Or, what if you're a brand new Ultima player and just love exploring? Then you could visit every area that the moon gate takes you to. Instead, Ultima 9 slowly tunnels you into its narrative. Not a bad thing in itself. Serpent Isle was the same way and that game is excellent. There's a bit once you visit Ambrosia and the Gargoyles on your way to restore the Humility Shrine. And honestly, after that, they really should have just opened up ship travel and let you visit each town in whatever order you wanted. With how the game is structured according to monster levels and such, it's not likely they could do that given how rushed this game is. I mentioned already that the gameplay is fine, but two things that really drag down the experience is the story and dungeon exploration. I'll talk about the dungeons first. The first dungeon you visit in this game is Dungeon of Spies near Britain. And honestly, it makes a good first impression. You enter, fight some cheesy rats and such, free some prisoners who mention that they were here to get rich off the Kieran Stones, which gives you the player a task to shoot for. If you take the time to explore the dungeon and find all four stones and place them on these pedestals here, you're rewarded with a nice looking shield that boosts your mana. Then, you battle your way down to the column to face off against your old companion Yolo, or rather, Uli, as the script calls him. Turns out the column's influence forced him on the side of the Worm Guards, allies of the Guardian under the command of Lord Blackthorn, a previous Ultima antagonist who shouldn't even be one in this game. You can kill him if you want to, and this process is also repeated in almost every dungeon, where you have to face off against an old companion of yours and find a way to subdue them without killing them. Actually a cool bit of player choice, except it really doesn't matter because when you restore the final shrine, they all get resurrected anyways. So, do what you want I guess. Unfortunately, Despise is really the only good dungeon in the game. As you go further along, visit a town, go to the dungeon to get the glyph, they get progressively worse. There are some dungeons that are basically all puzzles and very little fighting and holy virtues, they are awful. A commenter mentioned that it feels like the dungeons were designed by different people, and honestly, I believe it. Back then, 3D games were just taken off, and developers always put the most annoying stuff in it back in the day. This dungeon you're seeing right now is Dungeon Deceit near Moonglow. You be the judge. Does this look fun? I'll tell you right now, it's not fun at all. I also had to do it twice because I killed the Avatar's companion at the very end of it. There's one really annoying bit here that I had trouble with on my second run through. You have to align this block a certain way so a projectile hits it. I didn't have problems the first time, even though the block looked completely off. Second time, I aligned it exactly how I did last time, and it didn't work. Even following the guide which said press these two buttons nine times each, it still wouldn't work. It worked eventually, but it was a little frustrating. And I like puzzles just fine, but there really needs to be a balance here. A good measure of combat, collecting loot, experience points, broken by interesting segments of puzzle design and NPC conversations. You know, something like the Lizardman translation quest in Ultimate Underworld 1. I know it's a side game developed by Blue Sky and later Looking Glass, but something to get engaged with the world you're interacting with along that vein is perfect. Another dungeon I can't neglect talking about is Dungeon Shame near Trinzic. It's similar to Deceit, in which there's very little monsters to slay. You got this puzzle where you have to press the right switch so the orb hits the right target, flick all these levers before the eye on the center pedestal sees you, and click on all these statues when they glow in the correct color. The last one I want to mention is Dungeon Distard. You have to visit this place for the fighters of Valoria in order to slay a red dragon. I mean, that shouldn't be too hard, right? The Avatar is the Titan of Aether. Or at least, he's supposed to be. I'll mention that bit later on, but this dungeon is fairly hellish not because of what I explained earlier, but requires a heck of a lot of items in order to progress. On top of that, the dungeon itself is easy to get lost in. You need to find a severed head, a red candle, a red flask, a red skull, and a globe in order to progress, and while you do that, you need to find the five dragon shells just to open the way to Talornia, the red dragon. Dungeons are supposed to get more complex and difficult later on, but like I said, it's so easy to get lost in these games because the environments are so similar to each other. So get ready for a heck of a lot of backtracking. But at least it's not so puzzle oriented like the other dungeons. Honestly, the best things about this game is Dungeon Despise and the Overworld. 
The dungeons are the weakest point overall, as well as the storyline. It's basically visit a town, talk to NPCs, go to the dungeon, conquer it, find the sigil, find the mantra, restore the shrine, and do it again for each and every town. Like I said, can you imagine having to do this in Ultima 7 just to unlock the next area? Imagine visiting Despise first before being allowed to go to Euro Minog. Then you're given a ship you can't even control for a while, just to repeat the process all over again with no interesting side quest to sink your teeth into. Honestly, the only side thing I really liked is tricking this troll here every time I ran past him. Who dare cross my bridge? All who cross bridge must pay toll. Must give ten gold to cross. Ten gold pieces? How much is that? And yeah, that's supposed to be a troll. He's really just a scaled up goblin model. Let's move on to the avatar. The original script was scrapped in favor of a new one for the 3D version, and as you all know, his lines, as well as the overall storyline, is just... foobard. To give a brief summary, a lot of the times, the Avatar acts absolutely clueless about... well... everything. Things like him asking about the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom, who the gargoyles are, not knowing the mantras to each shrine that was all but required in order for him to become the Avatar in Ultimate 4, it's like... who is this guy? Well, there is a theory out there that I want to put in this video. I remember reading about this a long time ago and it makes a lot of sense. What if the Avatar isn't the real Avatar? What if he was killed in the end of Pagan? Now, hear me out. There were these monsters in Pagan called Changelings. You can probably guess where I'm going with this already. Now, there were Changelings in the Ethereal Void before the Avatar faced off against the Titans. What if the Avatar, right before becoming the Titan of Aether, was killed by said Changeling? What if the Changeling used the Obelisk Tip became the Titan of Aether, read through the Avatar's diary, and used his knowledge to go back home to Britannia, or rather, Earth. That would explain his lack of knowledge about, well, anything. But anyways, I'm kidding, so don't take this bit seriously. I'm not trying to rationalize the ridiculousness of the story or the Avatar's lines or anything like that. You don't even need to choose these dialogue options during conversation if you don't want to. They're really there to just to give new players some information about Ultima lore. Some NPCs like this gargoyle are surprised the Avatar doesn't know about this stuff like the gargoyles in the Codex. There's better ways to teach a new Ultima player I know, I'll explain that later on. But that was the dev's intention here at least. But anyways, my disappointment with this game increased the further along I got into it. Ultima 7 and 8 were my first Ultima game, so I wasn't a long time fan just yet, but the farther I got into this game, the more weird it got even to me. Just the presentation atmosphere of the world felt off. The cheesy cutscenes, characters that aren't even characters anymore, villains reduced to cardboard cutouts such as Lord Blackthorn. I never knew a whole lot about Blackthorn back then other than what I read at the time, but after experiencing that game for myself, I get it now. Blackthorn is reduced to a typical cartoon villain. It's embarrassing to seem like this. To explain briefly, Blackthorn ruled as regent of Britannia after Lord British, quote, disappeared and was under the influence of the Shadow Lords, basically seduced by their powers. He got his redemption arc back in the Serpent Isle. You read a book on Monk Isle about Blackthorn finding peace with the monks there after being seduced by the Shadow Lords, so seeing him in this game just doesn't make any sense. There's other things as well, such as the famous museum in Britain that's supposed to show all the great feats of the Avatar, but ends up creating continuity issues across the Ultima series. I'll explain the stuff that stood out to me at the time. The first is Corgan's Fang, a magical dagger the Avatar gets from Mithran's house back on Pagan. Wouldn't the Avatar have it on his person if the player chose to pick it up at all? How did he get from the Avatar's inventory into Britain? Stuff like this just isn't explained. Next is the Tapestry, which is quite a mess. In the first three Ultima games, the Avatar is wearing his Avatar outfit. He shouldn't because he became the Avatar in Ultima 4. And then there's the Ultima 7 bit where it looks like the Black Gate is outside instead of inside. And the execution scene on Pagan having clear blue skies when the sun is supposed to be hidden by thick clouds. Not to mention that the executioner is supposed to be a woman, and the Avatar himself wasn't even trying to stop the execution like this scene suggests. 
And it was unknown to me at the time, but the famous Skull of Mondain shows up as an exhibit, which really shouldn't be there as the Avatar tossed it in a volcano in Ultima 4. It's also very deadly and can kill pretty much anyone nearby, so it being in here is very very dangerous, but then again it shouldn't even be here in the first place. Other than that, the Talisman of Infinity shows up as an exhibit too. In Ultima 7, it was used to banish the Core of Exodus into the Ethereal Void on the Isle of Fire. How it showed up here, I have no idea. The game doesn't explain it. Those are just a few examples, but moving on. There's one scene we all know about, the famous Dupre scene, everyone's favorite alcoholic paladin. Now, I talked about Serpent Isle already, but I imagine a lot of Ultima fans or otherwise know that Dupre's soul in Serpent Isle was used to recreate the Chaos Serpent, and it was one of the key things needed in order to restore balance not only to Serpent Isle, Britannia, but also the entire universe. But for some reason they plop him in this game as a ghost, and when you finally get to restoring the spirituality shrine, it resurrects him, and any other companion you happen to kill along the way. You even find his ashes in a temple outside of Trinzic, which should be impossible, because they were destroyed when he fused with the Chaos Serpent. It was a huge undertaking even restoring the Chaos Serpent, as it required the Three Banes of Chaos, the Blackrock item, and Dupre's literal soul to hold it all together. And to put it into perspective, the Avatar was really the one meant to sacrifice himself instead of Dupre. Look, Ultima was never known for having strong continuity due to different writers across each game, but even back then this was something you could just not ignore. Dupre sacrificed himself in Serpent Isle because he didn't want Britannia to be without its Avatar. Having him come back like this just cheapens the weight of that scene, even if they managed to write it in a convincing way. And the biggest thing I want to mention, at least for me, is the Titan of Aether storyline. For those of you who watched my Ultima 8 video, you know that the one thing I was really excited for is the Avatar obtaining godlike powers in order to face off against the Guardian. I was imagining a large, epic battle of cosmic proportions that would shake Britannia at its foundation. I mean, that's what gods do, right? Well, it's not mentioned in this game. No combinations of the words Titan and Aether are found anywhere. In fact, there are only a few occasions where Pagan is outright mentioned. One is the Tapestry of Ages, the Corgan's Fang exhibit, another from a seer named Maltara outside of Britain, and again when you summon Malchir. You remember Malchir from Pagan? He's the master sorcerer the Avatar had to kill in order to obtain the Tongue of Flames, an item the Avatar had to use in order to free Pyros and absorb his powers in the Ethereal Void. However, there is no mention of Pagan anywhere even during this critical bit in the story. At this point, the Avatar had to free Shamino from the Shrine of Spirituality so he could find a way into the Stygian Abyss. Turns out, Lord British chased after Blackthorn into that hellish place, and the only way to enter is through a ritual you have to learn from Malchir. What is the ritual, you may be thinking? Well, Shamino says you need to summon a great demon native to the Abyss. The name of that demon? Maybe it's Arcadian? The demon we binded to the Blackrock Sword back in Ultima 7? It would make sense, well, not really, because he's not a native to the Abyss, so... Maybe the Slasher of Veils? That would be a great reference to the famous Underworld game, but no, it's not him either. Anyways, you want to know who it is? It's Pyros. Pyros, the Titan of Fire, Demon King, and Lord of Flames. A demon native to Pagan, and only Pagan. Not Britannia, and thus, not a native to the Abyss. And the worst thing about this entire exchange, when the Avatar says to do the gate ritual himself, Shamino tells him, It won't work, Avatar. You don't have that strength of magic. Are you serious? He's a Titan of Aether. What do we absorb Pyros for back in Ultima 8? Why is Pyros even here as his own entity? Why did the Avatar have to learn about the ritual to summon Pyros when he already did so on Pagan? He should be able to open the gate to the Stygian Abyss all on his own through the use of his titanic powers. There's no need to even summon Mountshear. In fact, Mountshear shouldn't even be here. He lived on Pagan, not Britannia. Even the circumstances of his death is wrong as he says the Avatar caused Pyros to destroy him. I seem to remember bonking my sword on his head last time. And is there any mention of the other Titans, namely Lithos, Stratos, and Hydros? You can probably guess the answer. Now, let's talk about the Guardian. Shamino tells you at this point that the Guardian is the Avatar's evil side that split away when it became the Avatar. Which also doesn't make any sense, because if the Avatar didn't have an evil side, then the option to steal or murder in future games would have been impossible. It would also have been impossible to even leave Pagan, considering all those dirty deeds he committed. 
Anyways, this piece is evident earlier in the game when the Guardian brings you to his fortress on Turfin. Attacking him here causes you to lose your health. But the simplicity of this plot twist caused me to shake my head back in the day. The Guardian was a very compelling villain to me, so to see them wave it away like, oh, he's just the Avatar's evil side is not something I find satisfying. The overall feel of the story is like this, and when you compare it to the cerebral storylines of Ultimus 5 through 8, it just leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth. Those games are very clever in their storytelling, and seeing the cutscenes in this game caused me to narrow my eyes even back then. I was fully expecting Blackthorn or Wormguard to tore their mustache at any moment. Going back to the Black Gate a little, when the Guardian warped the ethereal waves and caused the mages of the land to go insane, one of those mages, Rudiom, ended up creating a wand that can destroy Blackrock. Originally, Rudiom wanted that wand to transmute Blackrock, which would let someone put their hand through it like water. But because of the Aetherways being disrupted by the Guardian, Rudiom considered it a failure, calling it a piece of garbage. But fortunately for the Avatar, he ended up using it to stop the Guardian from entering Britannia. The Guardian's intention was to make the mages go insane and lose their magical powers, but he ended up indirectly screwing himself over. In the end, it was an insane mage that actually defeated him. And that's good writing. Another thing I find interesting is that the Avatar wouldn't have become the Titan of Aether, if the Guardian didn't urge the Pagans to create the Titans in the first place. The Avatar using what was originally created to destroy a world against the Guardian is another bit of good writing that I loved about that game. That gives you an example of how clever those stories were in previous Ultima games. And none of that is in Ultima 9, I'm sorry to say. Really, there honestly is some good stuff in this game. Again, that may be an unpopular opinion, but I found the gameplay fine. The graphics, art, visuals, and all that fun stuff, the music, this game blew my mind on the visual side of things back in the day. But anyways, when you finally face off against the Guardian, you have to undergo a ritual in the final area. Basically, you have to place all the virtue sigils you collected on convenient pedestals in the Guardian's throne room. After that, you chant the words of power in the middle in order to bring up a protective barrier, then cast the Armageddon spell by uttering more words of power, which destroys you and the Guardian. Then, the Avatar ascends and you're treated to another cheesy cutscene with the worst music to any conclusion of any video game while you sit back and wonder what the hell it is you just played. And that's Ultima 9 Ascension Story, the final quick version at least. Now. What I would like to see when it came to being the Titan of Aether, I know it makes sense that the Avatar wouldn't use his titanic powers right off the bat, but I would like to see some mention of it at least. For example, Lord British has a court magician named Nistel serving him. He's not in this game, but let's say that he is. Let's say you mention something along the lines of sensing etheric strength brewing within the Avatar. And over the course of the game, maybe a spell does a critical, like a light heal occasionally topping off your health bar, or a fireball can cause an explosion when it hits an enemy, all culminating with the Avatar finally coming into his own, and using his combined might to bring the Guardian to heal. Instead, the Avatar is told how to flick light switches, read books, and is generally just really clueless about everything. Really disappointing. This game really takes you out of the experience. So, what happened here? Why did we get something like this? Well, according to Scott Wetterschneider, the lead animator and art designer, the entire Ultima 9 team went to help get Ultima Online out the door. When they came back, they had to scrap and rebuild all the art, assets, all that fun stuff. That meant scrapping the storyline as well, what's known as the original Bob White plot. I was pretty surprised to hear about someone who worked on Ultima 9 from my video playthrough, so here are the comments. Going back to the original isometric 3D version, Wetter Schneider came into the project at the end of 95 alongside Ultima Online. The game rendered through CPUs, but they ended up having to rebuild everything later on once they found they had a lot of graphical power available. For those of us who gained on PCs back in the day, computer hardware advanced very quickly. You buy a video card and be obsolete in no time at all. Good times. However, like I said earlier, the team had to go help put Ultima Online out the door. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Ultima Online at the time was absolutely booming. It was competing directly against EverQuest, another big MMO at the time. It was a game I played quite a bit during high school, and even a little bit before Ultima 9 came out. Anyways, because of that, that left a small crew of just a couple of people for Ultima 9. The game itself was originally supposed to release in 1996. When they finally came back, they had to scrap and rebuild everything. Again. The repeated retooling as Wetterschneider said constantly set his team back, as well as the usual corporate influence during development. 
which is an absolute shame because there is a lot of effort in the design, graphics, animations, and visual style of this game. Ultima always pushed hardware limitations with each entry, and since 3D games were coming into their own at the time, well, that explains the scrapping process. There's also one other thing. There was an interview I watched some years ago where Richard Garrett was having a tough time pitching Ultima Online to the EA execs and salespeople. Big thanks to Pirate Canvas here who didn't mind me using clips of his video. Garrett at the time saw an opportunity for gamers to play with each other in cyberspace. When the World Wide Web came into existence, Gary and Star Long tried pitching the project to EA every six months. EA wasn't really interested in it, stating that the profits wouldn't be enough for the company when compared to other text and graphic muds of the time. Their salespeople, not their salespeople, aren't gamers, right? They're statisticians in a sense, and so they would go, "Okay, let's see what the comparables all are there on the market." And they went, "Well, the only comparable multiplayer games out there are things like Genie Air Warriors and these text muds and graphic muds," and you know they've only sold at most 15,000 subscribers or players. And so let's suppose you are twice as successful as any game in history that's been online. We'll give you 30,000 customers. And you, know, you do that math and they, that doesn't even come remotely close to selling enough to justify making the game. And so we, we went to our first pitch meeting and we were given our first no. And we went like, oh, you guys just don't get it. They eventually relented and granted Richard and his UO team $250,000 to help make the game. Six more months goes by. So literally our third time in the room, we make the same pitch, we get the same answer for the same logic. And basically me and Star, no joke, we just don't leave the room. We're standing up at the front of this conference room with all the EA vice presidents and, uh, and Larry Probe sitting up the front. And we say, guys, you are wrong. You are, you are wrong in so many ways, we just refuse to give up the podium. And so for example, first of all, it's gonna sell much more than that. But even if, it, even, if, even if that wasn't true, the budget we're asking for is less than 10% of Origin's budget. You know, we have earned the right to make, do this experiment to do this. And at the very least, Larry, I, I'm an, I have a letter here that I had pre-prepared that said, I will grant Richard and the UO team uh, $250,000, which is a nit in the worldwide budget, to do a demo, a prototype of Ultima Online to show you why your guys are all wrong. And they were still saying no, 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 and we just st stomped our feet and held our breath uh, until Larry said, give me the damn piece of paper, I'll sign it. And so uh, Larry signed the piece of paper and we walked out of the room and that started Ultima Online. And after immediately selling about 50,000 copies of his beta CDs for $5 each. We put up what was Electronic Arts' first website. They didn't even have an EA.com yet. All right. It was the UltimaOnline.com website. The website basically said, hey, we're the Ultima guys. We just made this game Ultima Online. It's only beta. And we've already spent our $250,000 making the beta. And so we'd love for you to beta test it for us, but we can't afford to send discs to anybody unless you're willing to pay for the disc. And so please sign up here to pay us $5 to receive the beta disc. And immediately more than 50,000 people signed up. Damn. <laughs> and th at that moment, EA got it. Oh ho, now EA is interested. If you want to check out the videos, I linked both parts to it in the description. The part where Gary talks about Ultima Online and Ultima 9 starts in part 2 of his interview. But anyways, even back then I noticed a few assets in Ultima 9 that came from Ultima Online. Things like the Gauntlet Cursor and the Quit Box. Both of those came straight from Ultima Online. Even some of the music sounds like it came from Ultima Online. Let me give another good example, actually. See this creature? Now hear this. For us Ultima Online veterans, that is the sound of a magical spell failing in Ultima Online. When a spell failed, we called it a fizzle. Now I'm not here to complain about copy-pasted assets, I mean, it really makes sense seeing it in Ultima 9 when they had to scrap the project a few times. Back then, I had a sort of dissonance playing this game, if that makes any sense. It's just another sign of the rushed nature of this game. So it's easy to place the blame on EA, and, well, that is true. It was also Ultima Online, and originally, they weren't even interested in it. Before UO, they'd rather he work on Ultima 9, not seeing the possible revenue stream from a massively multiplaying online game, which is still running to this day, by the way. 
But once they saw a profit in UO, they actually wanted to cancel Ultima 9. And I'll end this bit by saying that while I did enjoy Ultima Online, sometimes I wonder how this game would turn out if it never existed. Now, it's time to talk about the Bob White plot. GOG has a bunch of extras that explains what the original vision was, so let's dive into it a little bit. When the game starts, the Avatar starts on Britannia instead of Earth. The Avatar meets Hawkwind here in Stonegate, the Time Lord Ultima 7, 3, and 4. He mentions the Avatar subconsciously used his fledgling Titan of Aether powers and the Pagan in order to return home to Britannia. Those white pillars you see at the end of Ultima 8 is called the Nexus of Worlds, according to him. So hey, here you go, Pagan actually referenced here, and early on too. It's also referenced a few more times throughout this version of the story. Apparently once you meet with Lord British again, he's actually concerned by what he's heard about there. And in a good bit about how to let new players know about any Ultima lore in previous games, if the Avatar here asks LB who the companions are, LB comments that traveling between worlds has a disorienting effect. It reminds him who they are. However, when I read through the PDF file, I was disappointed to see that Blackthorn is still one of the main villains. His role is much the same, though he has different scenes than in the current version. Other bits of the story are the same as well, such as the columns and the moons being pulled out of their alignment, though they're not really the main focus of the story just yet. Instead, there's a civil war brewing between the followers of love and truth, and a lot of the stories the Avatar is spending time putting a stop to that. Your companions join you on your journey like in previous Ultima games, and Raven is still prevalent as well, along with her employer Samhain. With Raven, she'd be a male character if the Avatar were female, so there were definitely plans for gender selection. As the Avatar undergoes his quest to save Britannia from the Guardian, he meets Yolo once again in Cove, who is extremely old and bedridden. The Avatar mentions what the Guardian is up to on Britannia, which causes the old bard to ask who he is. And another good way to let new Ultima players know about previous entries, the Avatar would go ahead and summarize the events in Ultima 7 and 8 all the way to the current game. Some characters from previous Ultima games return as well, such as Sontre and Nicodemus, with Sontre being a companion of the Avatar, and Nicodemus being the mage who enchanted the Avatar's hourglass in Ultima 7, a very important item in that game. It was acquired to commune with the Time Lord and destroy one of the generators. There's still some inconsistencies in this one though, par for the course for the Ultima series I know. Remember the Well of Souls in Ultima 7 the undead city of Scar Bray? The one that got destroyed? Well, for some reason it's back, just like in the current version of Ultima 9. The Avatar here would travel down to the bottom of the Well of Souls and face off against a Draco Lich. He finds out here that the evil force that took over Horns during the main quest in Ultima 7 took over a dragon and continued its dominion over the city's spirituality. A little later on, after dealing with that bit in the story, the Avatar finds out the real origins of the Guardian at the Spirituality Shrine. The shrine basically states that after the Shadow Lords were destroyed, the shadows arose in the form of a wingless gargoyle with the powers of a winged gargoyle. This form told the gargoyles about the loss of the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom and instigated the War of the False Prophet in Ultima 6, as well as acting as their savior. The Avatar finds out through Blackthorn when the Avatar shattered Mondane's Gem of Immortality, his own essence became bound to it the same way Mondane's did. A great force was supposedly attracted to the strength of the Shattered Shards, which he revealed was the earliest form of the Guardian. That force focused itself into the Shadow Lords, being the opposites of the principles of truth, love, and courage. When the Avatar finally defeated the Shadow Lords, their forms coalesced into the Guardian. I much prefer this explanation than what we got, honestly. When the Avatar finally faces off against the Guardian, he confirms much of the same thing, taunting the Avatar that it was his own force that brought Britannia to his knees. In the ending of the game, after the Avatar defeats the Guardian, the survivors of Britannia gather at Scar Bray while Lord British and the Avatar stand at the top of Stonegate. At this moment, the moons are very nearly ripping Britannia apart due to being out of alignment because of the columns. Here, Scar Bray is protected by some sort of magical barrier, and then whisked up and off of Britannia and into the ethereal void. Then, Lord British casts Armageddon, and Britannia grows eerily quiet. Game ends. I have to bring this up too before continuing on, but there's a segment where the Avatar has to go to the Stygian Abyss like in the current version, though this time instead of helping Lord British with Blackthorn, it's so he can rescue the leaders of Love and Truth. The Avatar takes the glyph from the column there, and him and LB face off against a familiar creature from Underworld 1, the Slasher of Veils. The demon comes at them screaming, I'll swallow your soul, and LB replies with, Come get some. For some reason. Knew I had to mention this somehow. 
No joke, LB literally says this. And also, another inconsistency, because in Underworld 1, the slasher of Veils is all but invulnerable and can only be banished. At least in that game. You also acquire a lot of special artifacts too. The PDF suggests that you're going to be fighting him like a boss, it looks like. So if you have the GOG version of Ultima 9, you can pour through the PDF files and see for yourself, but if not, they're out there on the internet. I'll link it in the description just in case. The current story is obviously full of holes, but there are things in the Bob White plot that cause me to quirk an eyebrow or two. Blackthorn and the Will of Souls, for example, as well as the Slasher of Veils. It does seem to be a step up compared to what we got, but I don't know overall. But all in all, and to wrap up this video, there were times I had fun with Ultima 9. That may be an unpopular opinion, but honestly, exploring the overworld and getting into combat and looting is actually entertaining. The bogged down moments for me is the dungeon exploration. I just don't find the fun at all. Some of the fun is probably because I stream this game as well, but you could honestly do worse than this game if you just don't care about the story. For me, the story is what really truly disappointed me. It was only further enhanced when I got older and managed to play through the earlier games, as well as learning about the shaky development cycle Ascension went through. The devs working on this game just weren't the same devs that worked on Serpent Isle, for example. At least when I perused Hacky's page a little while doing this voiceover. Origin couldn't put in the Bob White plot into this new engine because of EA's deadline, so what we got is... Yeah. I know there's a lot of players out there who couldn't care less about story or lore in any video game, but to me, meaning and context as to why I'm facing off against monsters and villains, and why I'm delving into dangerous dungeons, really enhances the gameplay. But like I said, if you couldn't care less and haven't played Ultima 9, you could honestly do worse than this. I will say again that Ultima 9 crashed constantly for me throughout my playthrough, so be aware of that. If you're interested in seeing all the continuity errors, there's a page out there called Hacky's Nitpicks. It lists all the inconsistencies across the Ultima series in a nitpicky fashion, as it says. I remember reading it a long time ago, and believe me, it's a fun read. If you're an Ultima fan, I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. And that reminds me. I should mention again that Ultima 9 has what's called a dialogue patch you can install. I may replay this game again one day, and if I do, it'll be with this patch. It fixes a lot of the story, but you have to turn off the voices as a lot of the lines were rewritten. Hacky's Nitpick Pages has lists of what's included in the dialogue patch if you peruse the Ultima 9 section. Either way, it's a shame the series ended on such a poor note. You can probably have fun with this game if you treat it like fanfiction, but I've been okay with the series ending at Pagan if I knew Ascension was going to turn out like this. The errors, as we all know, are absolutely glaring. It sucks having to speak negative of this game because there are players out there who love Ultima 9. Reason for that is that this was their first Ultima game, so they didn't have previous entries to look back on. Kind of like with me and Ultima 8. And I get it, the gameplay like I said is honestly fine. The graphics back then, amazing. There was a lot of effort on the visual side of things. It really was impressive stuff seeing things transition from 2D to 3D. The only upside I can see is that maybe this game got people interested in the Ultima series, much like how 7 and 8 did for me. So in that respect, I don't really hate this game with a burning passion or anything like that. I wasn't a hardcore Ultima fan back in the day just yet, it was just a disappointing experience for me. Though I can't lie and say it didn't get amplified once I dived deeper into previous entries. And because of how this game turned out, we didn't get Ultima 10 which was slated to be worked on, if it wasn't already. Likely a good thing. But for now, I'm going to pretend the series ended right here. But anyways, thanks for watching.